Welcome, Megan. We're so happy to have you here. Um, so, uh, class, you may not know this, but in the past week, because there's been so much excitement around the speakers coming to class, it's kind of become um, an informal first pilot speaker series for the GDIM major. And so, Megan, you're officially our very first GDIM speaker ever, which is uh, quite an honor. We're really excited to have you. And um, this hopefully will be an annual thing that happens either outside of a class or inside of a class every quarter. Um, but you all are getting the benefit of the speakers in this class. Um, but I will, if there are any friends you have who are interested in visiting, just have them send me an email and they can definitely come and see the speakers in the future. I'm going to put um, in the chat the, the press release that the university put out today so that you have the tools to share with your friends what's going on. So you can use that if you want to get to it. But Megan Condis is an assistant professor, I should say Dr. Megan Condis is an assistant professor of communication at Texas Tech University. Um, Megan writes on masculinity in digital media and has written, written an, an amazing book called Gaming Masculinity. And it her work really just tries to look at the way that gaming culture overlaps with online culture today, right? Like the intersection of those two things and how there's some discourse. And so naturally, Megan decided to write an essay about Wendy's Feast of Champions. <laughs> um, I think that's slightly related to her main research trajectory, hopefully a research trajectory that she's going to work more on in the future. But I'm really excited whenever I see work that um, looks at how RPGs work in the sort of like public and commercial spheres. And Megan's work, I think, is some of the best written work on that topic. So I'm really excited to introduce you all to Megan. I've been telling her how much you all enjoyed or did not enjoy the Wendy's uh, Feast of Legends game. And so I know she's looking forward to having some really interesting conversations with you all. And with that said, Megan, please take it away. Yeah, uh, let's see. Oh, um, well, you guys, you guys read the article, so I probably don't have to do too much screen sharing. <clears throat> but um, thank you guys. Um, I'm really excited to to chat with you all and to I, to hear what you guys thought of this game because it's such a weird game. And yeah, as as you were saying before, so a lot of times my research is about how video games can be persuasive around what can be some really heavy topics. So around you know, gender and identity. Um, I have kind of like a long standing project where I look into um, like white supremacist recruitment in video games and like how people can try to create, uh, you know, like behavioral and cultural funnels that kind of drive people into these spaces. And so this, this project on Wendy's was kind of like my gift to myself to say, I want to look at something that's like a little lower stakes and a little more fun, but then it, you know, it turns out there's so many interesting wrinkles with regard to it that, you know, it ended up being this, this really fruitful project. So just to kind of give you a reminder, if it's been a while since you, you did the reading, uh, what I wrote about was this uh, kind of like Dungeons and Dragons style role-playing game that was developed by Wendy's as, as a marketing uh, ploy, I guess, or like as a marketing campaign. And what I wanted to write about was, you know, is this kind of thing actually persuasive? And if so, how is it persuasive? Because at first glance, I think it's really easy to say like, oh, well, in the game, you eat Wendy's food and that makes you stronger. And that's the advertisement, right? But I don't get the sense um, from when I ran the campaign with some friends that that was actually very persuasive that anyone was coming away from the game going like, you know, man, the next time I'm really need a pick me up, I should go eat a frosty. Like, I don't, I don't think it actually convinced anyone in that sense. So it wasn't like this kind of direct one-to-one. -one, I see the food working in this way. And therefore I believe that it's going to work this way in the real world. You know, instead it was more a, a kind of campaign that was taking place on the meta level of this food is associated with games and games are cool. And so therefore this food becomes associated with cool. But even there, I'm not sure. And I'd be really interested to, to start with this question for you guys, I guess, like when you were playing through this game, it, it seems like it's aiming itself 
at people who would take a class like this, at people who are interested in role playing and in uh, board gaming and in, in these types of, of hobbies. Is it, is it effective as a, as a persuasive tool? Did it make you feel kind of predisposed to liking Wendy's? Like, I, I really don't know how that works. So I'm curious to hear from you guys. And the, I see people doing the little hand icons. So I don't know, uh, Dr. Trammell, do you want to call on folks or do you want me to call on folks? How do you want to run that? Oh, we can do it either way, but I am tracking folks and I'm tracking comments also in the chat. So, oh, okay, cool. Um, um, let's see, can I switch it to, there's, there's a lot that are even outside of my view. So maybe I'll just, I'll just go down the line of, of who I can see. I'm not sure if this is the right order. That, that sounds good. Uh, but Aaron, I saw that you raised the hand emoji. What are you thinking? Um, I kind of touched on this last class, but um, I'm going to say it again. It's really interesting because like from an advertising standpoint, it's kind of a failure because if you want to properly market something, then you have to go to like the majorities within a community, right? Mm. And I think within the tabletop community, we can all kind of agree that there's like kind of the very combat, like rule lawyery, very pedantic nerd. And then there's like the absolute subversion of that. So we touched on kids on bikes as a system and how that's like mechanically simple. So it allows for some people to get into it and make a more complex narrative based on that. Whereas they didn't really, they didn't hit a sweet spot in any way really. Cause they kind mm. of made bad puns that I think we all talked about that we all didn't really like most of the puns. And then it's mechanically simple, but narratively complex. So the player doesn't have enough room to play with it or be interested in it. As well as like in fifth edition, a person could definitely do something much more fun without making a whole new system. Like Dimension 20 already ha has a food-based campaign that is like worlds better. Mm. So if we're gonna say that they wanted to do something that impressed the TTRBG community, then they pretty much failed. Yeah, Crown of Candy. It's fantastic. Ooh. I love it. <laughs> that, okay, I'm making a note of that. So look up Crown of Candy. But yeah, so, so it's really interesting. Like it, it is a game where you don't get much of a choice in how you approach any particular problem, right? And you don't really get a choice in terms of how your characters apparently feel about, for example, Queen Wendy. And I wonder how much of that is because, and, and it turns out like they were correct to worry about this, that if you allow people too much freedom with your brand, then they might take it in a way that is not good for you. Like, well, what if people decide we want to rebel against Queen Wendy? Well, that's, you can't, period. Sorry. Like, yeah. Like, what, what do you do with that? I think that's a really interesting question. But yeah, that's also interesting to think about like, you know, if you're, if you're already going for this like small subculture, you want it to appeal to as many people within that small cult subculture as possible. And so did, is this game going to successfully do that or not? And it sounds like a lot of you guys came to the conclusion that it, it wasn't impressive to you. So that's really interesting. Uh, the next hand that I see on the screen is Alec. Hi. Uh... Hi. So predisposition, uh, I actually have a kind of strong bias. I don't like Wendy's advertising like at all. Uh, I have a, I've been very annoyed with them over the years, but going into this, I try to have an open mind because I like the idea behind it. Mm. But over, overall, I felt the effort was kind of wasted because what I've noticed with um, advertising towards like this kind of like towards games or this kind of like thing in general is that the ones that succeed are usually on both ends of the spectrum as far as scale. So they're either like really big, like, you know, grandiose, like attempts like KFCs, like, uh, you know, air fryer PC, or they're on the opposite end and they're very like niche, like uh, Pepsi man's like very bizarre niche running game. But mm -hmm. I think with Wendy's here, they kind of aimed at an audience that was never going to be appeased by this. They went for, you know, role playing, which is a very, you know, big genre. And they kind of went into it with, you know, an advertising campaign. And the attempt was kind of overall kind of mediocre. So it just ended up being kind of it seemed like wasted effort to me. 
So it for unfortunately, you know, or fortunately, however you tend to view it, I think advertising campaigns really need to pick their battles at the moment because depending on where you aim for as far as like a genre of like games or whatever you want to cover, it's going to affect how, you know, even if you did a good job, how people view you. Yeah, and I mean, and it's interesting too to see how that ended up rebounding on to like critical role. So when they jump in and want to participate, and I'm sure we'll end up talking about them in more depth in a little bit, but like, you know, when they ended up jumping on, then it became a, a sort of PR issue for them to deal with as well. So thanks, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, the next uh, hand in the order that I see is Kyle. Yeah, hello. Um, I, I do remember that you did write the uh, article that we had to read for Case of Legends, but uh, beyond all that, I, I, went, I went into this entire line of discussion thinking that it was actually impossible for a brand to make an effective tabletop RPG. But after thinking about what somebody said about how, uh, what you said about like, um, the problem is that people have too much freedom so they can do whatever they want with the brand. I think that's kind of the core of like why this didn't work. It's because they tried to police people and force people to play the adventure straight or play the adventure exactly how it's written. Where, whereas with tabletop role-playing games, a lot of the appeal of what you can do in them is being able to steer the story wherever the players feel most comfortable or just go off, just go out on a limb and say, all right, I want to do this this time. And it's like, but why? The question isn't, anyways, I'm, I'm, I'm going off on a tangent here. It's my, I think that if, if advertising or like any companies that put out like a similar system like Wendy's, or maybe if Wendy's takes another go at Feast of Legends, I think if they really want to be successful with it, they need to be able to let people have the freedom to steer the story wherever they want, even if it is completely counter to what the brand's original message was with their system. Because, I mean, whether you are directly supporting Wendy's or actively trying to destroy Wendy's in your arc version of the RPG, you are writing a story using their system and you are making connections that way. So I think that would be more in line with the spirit of tabletop games instead of directly clashing with it, like with what they did with Feast of Legends 2019 or something. Yeah, and it, so people are responding to you in the chat and really echoing you. So Matthew said, Wendy's seem to want to force the players into a single course of action and any dungeon master knows that you cannot get players to follow the intended plot. Someone else called it railroading. And so I think, I think what you're saying is really like, resonating with people and it makes me think like so if the point of writing this game wasn't to convince anyone of the magical you know superhuman powers that the food gives you but rather was to convince you Wendy's gets it we're hip and cool and we understand gaming then they would understand that right and they would have written a game that allowed for that type of freedom and they would have demonstrated that they had the confidence to like take the hit if someone were to take it in, in, a, in a wrong direction, which makes me think about like Wendy's Twitter is sort of famous for this, right? Like they like to, what do you call it? Like burn people on Twitter or that's not the right word. What's the word for roast? That's right. That's right. Oh, cause it's a food thing. <laughs> yes. Thank you, chat. I mean, um, there are some people that dislike what just Wendy's is doing on the Twitter account. And I just look oh, for sure. brands entirely. There's just some people that are completely just naughty about that. They think it's annoying. They think oh, it's absolutely. But the thing about that persona is like, it's tough, right? Like you insult me. And instead of being like, oh, so sorry to hear you had a negative experience. They roast you back. Right. And that like shows, it's, it's, I think it's meant to demonstrate a kind of like, we are, we have an attitude or we have this like cool, we don't, we don't care what you think. Oh, and yeah, it definitely. seems like, it seems like one thing that they could have done with this game would have been to say, we created this cool world for you, do whatever you want with it. And maybe even roast us in the world. We don't care. And that maybe would have been more effective at getting people to say they really get gamers. <laughs> Oh yeah. Then I mean, it was if they were just like, here is a story, and you may play it the way that mommy and daddy say that you may play it. 
Yeah, but no, I think that's a really good point. I was looking in the chat earlier and they said that a lot of the base story, okay, you know what, to be fair, I, I won't take up any more time after this. I just want to say one last thing. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah. That people are saying in the chat, like the base story to use a rewrite, right? And I, I, I agree because a lot of the stuff in the in the story was just like kind of put out there and never really explained or like there's no connection between characters and stuff like that. Hmm. It's just go here, take out the French fry forest hunger pangs go there go deal with the ice chest or something something the adventure's over or something mm. anyways yeah yeah no that that makes total sense and uh maybe if i, I if there's i'm this maybe just going in the random order isn't so great so did someone want to like hook on to that and and jump forward in the line or did are we wanting this to switch topics chris is saying he has something to add on to that to that same line of thinking so go ahead yeah, that was actually specifically what I wanted to talk about was, yeah. I think it's very interesting that narrative, the narrative is exponentially hurt by it being an advertising game, because like the idea of a kingdom where the, like the different factions are based off of fast food is interesting in theory, but the, this like only one paragon of good that is Wendy's only works if you're already on board the Wendy's train in that way. Mm -hmm. And like, even as somebody who enjoys Wendy's, I want to say this, uh, the food at least, um, did not make me want to eat Wendy's any more or less and did not like change my opinion of Wendy's at all. It was neutral for me. But the, the fact that they, since it's an advertising game, they obviously can't say anything positive about any competitors. So we're left with this very bland, boring uh, political conflict it is even too much of a stretch to say uh <laughs> and i see that my cat has completely uh blocked out anything <laughs> from hearing yeah. anything else i said <laughs> no uh, but yeah you make a good point like we people who play these types of games are perhaps like we've we've moved beyond like i i am a an agent of the kingdom of light and we are all good and we are fighting against the dark people who are all bad and like that that really simplistic like that you don't really need to know anyone's motivations you just need to go through and do the rolling the yeah. dice and mm. using the abilities mm. and you can see that growing out of style too with um the popularity of monstrous races in D D and even wizard of the coast starting to push back away from the um is assigning alignments to intelligent humanoid monsters in the right. manual now. Uh, like the, the latest, I, something interesting I thought, uh, the latest uh, monster manual, the Treasury of Dragons specifically, says usually before the alignment for all of the dragons, because they're trying to imply now that there's more of a, um, it, it could because players want more nuance in their storytelling than that. They don't just want this is good, this is evil, just throw dice and kill things. Yeah, well, and it's so it's uh, it's an issue of tabletop role-playing games having penetrated the public consciousness enough that people know like alignment is even a thing. <laughs> and so it's like maybe this, this version of it in like the popular imagination outside of the subculture is lagging 10, 15 years behind what is actually taking place within the hobby. And so then you end up making a version that feels very like simplistic and not simplistic mechanically. Again, like someone else was saying, like it's very robust mechanically is all these stats and abilities and stuff. Yeah. Th very that simplistic was, narratively. That was another question I brought up in my journal too, was I wonder, cause that must've cost money to make that and the art assets look nice. Like, there was money that went into this, and I'm very curious if it had any return on investment. Yeah, and I mean, this is where I will say my, so my PhD is in English literature, so I wouldn't even know how to begin to measure that, but I don't, on their end, I don't know if, if that's a thing that they track or, I mean, in the one sense, you could say um, it was all over Twitter and people were posting their cosplays and they're like, here's a photo of my friends like playing it. So they got some engagement. I don't, I don't know if anyone ever looked to see if it affected like sales concretely. I mean, so I I'm guess really engagement sure. is kind of all they're going for. They're like, that's what advertisement is nowadays. Right. Hmm. <laughs> 
Uh, uh, yeah. did, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, so you, sorry, your your interest in that just made a uh, thought I've had because I'm a film and media studies major, so we we talk about this a lot, um, mm. which is that the old advertisements that were just basically trying propaganda posters don't work anymore. The only thing you can do is get engagement. I mean, mm. that's the last thing I want to say on it. I'll let someone else stop taking up the time. Yeah. Um, did anyone else want to kind of pick up on that thread of like engagement, social media? I, I see, I saw Brian and then Yoon and then Mia. So a lot of people, sorry. Maybe we'll start with Brian since that's who I saw first. Hi, um, I just wanted to, I guess, try to answer a question about the, how successful was this? Mm -hmm. um, coming from like a naive first time tabletop role-playing uh, experience. Um, and while I read your, your journal, I kind of couldn't help, I admit, I couldn't help but feel kind of excited in the idea of it. Mm -hmm. um, the idea of using food in real life to, ex to get like some type of meaning in the game world, in the role-playing world was really something that caught my eye and I, I couldn't help but feel excited to play it. Mm -hmm. But, and, but of course, while I started playing it, I feel like uh, yeah, again, adding to someone who said they were disappointed from the game, I did feel like there was too much emphasis on trying to create this narrative or rather build on a narrative that they've already been making mm -hmm. about being this whole like better franchise than the rest. And I felt like while that mechanic that they did implement is kind of interesting in trying to bridge the real world into the fantasy world mm -hmm. was really a good idea I feel like they kind of missed they kind of just kind of handicapped it by doing this advertisement mm. so this was the first like tabletop rolling dice type role-playing experience you've ever had was this game yes and I, wow and what a so, what a one to start on <laughs> <laughs> yeah and I know I'm sure other people who are more experience with tabletop games felt that this game was restricting mm -hmm. as my first one I felt like this was so much freedom like you can do anything mm -hmm. I am sure that if I look into other games there'll be much more to do but as for my first experience I felt like this was almost like wow that's in that's insane how much power you have in yeah game. so that's really interesting to me because I do wonder there must have been a lot of folks who had never, you know, they, they would never go into like a game store and buy like the Dungeons and Dragons Dungeon Master's Guide, right? But then they see this and it's free and they think, yeah, I'll give it a try. And so, and yeah, so maybe to them as, as someone who's not familiar with the hobby, I'd be, inter I'd be interested, you know, if, if we, this is maybe like a research project we need to, to, try to do a survey of people and compare like people who have experience with tabletop role-playing games versus people who this was their first one and, and kind of see how they felt about the mechanics, how they felt about the narrative. Cause yeah, if, if when you hear tabletop, you think like monopoly and then you're given this, then you're just like, oh my God, I can, well, all these things I can do. I'm not just like rolling dice and moving in a square. I can choose my ability. I can be a baked potato. Like there's so many things you can do. That must be pretty wild. Uh, there was, is it Yoon? Am I pronouncing that correctly? Yeah, you said you uh, had yeah. something to say along these lines as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's like exactly what I wanted to say. Um, I think Are you a first timer of, too? I played like a little bit. Okay. But it kind of goes with my point later. Um, there's a lot of evidence that sh like kind of points to this campaign being targeted towards people who've either heard of D&D peripherally, mm. peripherally because I feel like in recent days with how popular Critical Role and other D&D podcasts have been. Uh, tabletop is kind of going into the public consciousness, but not enough so that the general public knows about how you play it. Mm. Um, and also how we all talked about how this was really cool in theory, but they simplified a lot of the systems, especially like character building and the narrative. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we all know that a veteran would, uh, it would just not hold up to their standards because we, this was a pandering game from the start. Right. So I feel like the writers knew this from the beginning and try to sell us on the promise of of D and D role play, um, and it's actually kind of hard to kind of organize a campaign because you need to get a lot of different people to get a schedule and all play mm. together for like hours on end. Um, and I was really interested in D and D in like high school, 
but because of that and I couldn't really um play it for a long time so I only had like a bunch of like single sessions with new characters um so I feel like I was the target demographic where people who are interested in D&D &D in theory but cannot actually play it enough so that um I can see the systems falling apart right in front of me hmm. um I would see this and be like well that when he's doing D&D &D, that's so cool but like not actually act on it to see it like <laughs> like myself yeah, like just the the sort of passing and folks are saying in the in the chat too, like the virality of it, like, you know, just knowing that it exists might give people kind of like a, a happy feeling of like, oh, that's wacky. What a weird thing. I'm glad that weird thing exists in the world. And then that maybe can just, you know, make people have positive associations like they went out there and they tried this weird thing. Um, and then the last, the last person who said uh, kind of in this vein or that uh, the hand that I saw was Mia. Yeah. Um, well, my, I'm sorry. My camera stays <laughs> off because it lags a bit. No, you're totally but, great. Um, uh, I do definitely agree with all the points brought up. I think I'm also someone who doesn't have very much D&D experience. This is my second campaign. And one thing I really didn't like that kind of irked me a little bit about D D and prevented me from getting into it because i was always interested in it it was the complexity and the planning the pre-planning that goes into it it's definitely something that turns people away and so the simplicity in the wendy's campaign of just even just having pre-made character sheets you could just write the cool stuff about your character and keep the stat rolling you know something that the company could handle is really alluring i think for new D, &D players however mm. it's the it's that same like excitement of just being able to do anything you want that freedom is what makes D, &D so alluring and what makes all that pre-planning worth it and wendy's doesn't really succeed in that it the campaign is really simplistic and i think it's unfortunately the complexity of D, &D which makes it which makes the freedom allowed just because there's mm. so much planning in place. And so at the risk of a more simplistic narrative, you lose complexity. And that's really unfortunate because I feel like, um, I feel like they could have done something really good with this. And it, it just feels that they played it very safely. And that's where the social media thing comes in. I think that mm. like you said, like, I wish Wendy's took in that kind of, um, I don't care sort of swagger into most of their advertising projects and it might've turned out better. I think social media, especially for these big companies they are usually run by one or two people mm. and they're really just given free reign. Social media is kind of like the experimenting grounds to see what responds, what people respond well to. And unfortunately, like that's why like social media is sort of like the saving grace for some of these companies. Cause like they're just trying new things and some things just happen to work really well but they're too scared to do it like on the corporate scale. So yeah. they put money into this and they were like, we're going to do this. We're going to appeal to this ground, this like niche group of people. It's going to be awesome. But like, what if it goes wrong? So let's just, you know, make it super simple and, you know, just play the whole safe. committee is involved now. Right. Like, right. Yeah. And that's, what's really disappointing. Cause like they were almost there. It was so close and it's not even that bad of a campaign. I know people bash it a lot, but like, the thing that makes it horrible is that it's just like, it's okay. And that's like the worst thing. <laughs> that's really interesting. Yeah. And you know, maybe let horrible, me posit something. It's not necessarily either. Say it one more time. I'm sorry. We repeat that. Oh, you muted. We repeat that last sentence one more time. Oh, um, I guess it's, that's what makes things like when people say, oh, this is so disappointing. It's the most disappointing thing. Like it's usually never like a horrible thing. It's like, it was so close mm. to getting where it could have been, but it just falls short. And so realistic, like logically, like I, I use like a grade, like it could have been like, logically speaking, the game is like an, like an 80, but it could mm. have been like a hundred. And the fact that it just, it was so close to something or like, I guess it'd be like an 89 and a 90. It's like so close, but it's not quite there. And that kind of makes it worse. Mm. Well, yeah, because it's like, you can see what it could have been. Whereas if it was a total disaster, you just think, 
well, that was a total disaster, but you don't have the like letdown of, oh man, we could have had the school thing. Right. Mm. Especially when it's like, even if something is like so horrible, it could be like that sort of thing where even like Pepsi Man, someone brought up Pepsi Man, like where it's just so absurd, people just start to ironically and then eventually unironically like it. Like it could have been like a complete disaster and people would have loved it, but in the end, it's just kind of lukewarm. Yeah. Well, and I also, so I, I see some other hands and I'm going to circle to you guys in just a second, but I also want to throw this idea in the mix, which is that another audience for this game is the people who give out awards for advertising and the people who give out those awards, I don't know if they're super invested in like, did this advertisement actually resonate with the subcultural community that it's aimed at. I think they're more interested in, um, does this advertisement um, grapple with things that are considered like, so what's the word I wanna use for this? Like trendy right now? And gamification in general is extremely trendy right now. Whether it's like, I'm turning things into a digital app that gives me points on my phone or whether it's, you know, I'm making a uh, KFC did their dating app game or whether it's this. And so in that sense, you know, just the fact that they made it a game and that they invested these, this art into it and that they can demonstrate that they're participating in gamer culture is itself perhaps enough for some of these like award giving institutions to say like, wow, they did the thing. They, in, they are invested in this space, even when, because none of those people are probably tabletop enthusiasts. So they don't necessarily have the, the conversations that we do about, oh, it was so close, but it like it was let down these different ways. They just say, oh, look, it's interactive. And people were dressing up in costumes on Twitter. And, you know, my kid plays game, he plays the Fortnite. And so that's like this, right? Like, as, as a scholar who works in games, and I don't know if, if maybe uh, Aaron could speak to this, like you get that a lot where like people don't necessarily know what you work on exactly, but they just have a sense like, that's a cool thing nowadays, right? And you just go, yeah, so please, so please give me a grant or whatever. And in this case, you know, maybe that was also one of the target audiences. Yeah, At any I rate, I just want to kind of throw that idea out there. Dr. Trammell, were you going to jump yeah, in? I mean, I hear you? you can call me Aaron. I, I use Aaron. This oh, okay, cool. Uh, I, I am uh, kind of invited to speak to NFTs um, and video games on a panel recently. Mm. And I had to decline. I was like, I actually know nothing about this. Yeah. I know I probably don't like, I know I don't know, I probably don't like it, but I, I'm not an expert on that. Oh, yeah. People have asked me like, what, can you explain the blockchain to me? I'm like, I cannot. Again, English literature. So no, I cannot explain the blockchain to you other than what the things that I've heard about it, like that, you know, it takes up a lot of energy or whatever, but. Um, okay, so other hands that are up. I see Eric is up. Where do you want to pivot Hello. to? Hi. Um, okay, like I remember, uh, I actually like wrote some words when back, not, not even, back when it came out but like sometime after like last year I wrote about uh the the dating KFC dating simulator game yeah that um I don't remember the exact words that I wrote because were they was, swear words Eric? it's like no it's like oh. <laughs> it's I'm like just kidding I'm just messing with you I'm it's like a 3,000 word essay about oh, awesome. why it's awful and um I just a feel really mad about how corporations are like co-opting this language of relatability mm. that's caused by like angst that's coming as like a direct result of late capitalism into a capitalistic tool and the other hand feels sad for the laborers and the game designers who work so hard in this product Hmm. that was so clearly influenced by management decision to be a uh, like blatant advertisement rather than a medium of creativity. Hmm. Like, 
I can see like in both cases, but even more so in Wendy's. Like I've uh I know like I've seen I've read the words of uh the designer who worked on the KFC dating simulator. Like I know the person like I I I respect that designer. But well, I don't know like anyone who worked on this game personally, but I can see uh pieces, bits and pieces where they were like trying to be creative as possible within this like adver game uh constraints, but then they fell short because they were so busy like jamming in the four for four joke all the mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. Or like uh, and what what do I remember from my own campaign? Um, oh, I felt per personally victimized by uh, that's the T. <laughs> T sisters or whoever. Yeah. That, uh, like the game just like not, just that like that invisible queerness sort of, so to say, like, it, by co-opting language that is like very specifically adjacent to queer culture but never really recognizing any part of it was not only like it felt cheesy but also it just felt offensive to a core it did not feel very good yeah like where so something that came from a specific culture ends up getting kind of diluted down to, well, it's just internet culture or youth yeah. culture. And then now becomes, well, let's suck it up to use it as, you know, put it right side by side with, you know, like the Baconator <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Like the, the, you know, explicitly uh, like, anti-societal like language and traditions that like originated from like black and um, BIPOC queer creators mm. and drag queens and trans people being diluted into the mainstream culture as just internet culture and then being co-opted back by cooperations into this God, I don't know what to say. Um, so, oh, I'm I'm so mad. I'm so sorry. No, it's no, you're good. Infuriating. Um, just this corporate language to sell product is just so disgusting in so many levels. That, yeah, I. No, for sure. Um, and I appreciate you bringing that up because I think it's really easy to get sucked into like the jokey jokiness of it and be like wasn't wasn't this part silly and it makes me think of um so there's a scholar named dick hebdige who wrote a book called subcultures and he talks about this uh and like one of his main examples that he uses like punk rock as this like rebellious like we want to protest the way like the class exploitation and colonialism and like fuck the queen and then it ends up getting eventually like recuperated and recycled into things that can be a part of like a Chevy truck commercial or, or whatever. And so, you know, this isn't like the first time that it happens, but it is, it is interesting in this case to see like the cycle happens so fast where it's like this thing originated in on black Twitter or on in like queer culture and like to see it get turned into grist for the mill so quickly, like within a couple years is is can be pretty like shocking and disturbing i guess and like the i guess i mean i see a little hope in that the uh the current generation is like so adjacent to these histories that they recognize this uh co-opt option and like this sort of uh hijacking of language when they see it mm -hmm. so that's because like they're not only internet savvy but also slowly like internet is becoming more and more like inclusive and like just in general being a medium for these people to thrive in 
right? So as the pe these people like learn more history and recognize these patterns employed by corporations, they begin to see through the veneer and you know recognize that this is subculture being co-opted by corporations. Mm. And hence, someone in the chat, I'm, I'm sorry, it's too far and I don't know if I'll be able to find it, um, mentioned like silence brand as, as an example of that, right? Like people saying, wait a second, we see what you're doing and we're actually going to create a, a system for you to make narratives that go against that or, oh shoot, I'm not going to be able to think of what it's called now. Or I'll look it up and I'll email it. Um, to your professor so that he can email it out to you. But there's this great uh, tabletop role-playing game um, where you play as punks and you get to define punk however you want, like whether it's cyberpunk, whether it's solar punk, whether, whether it's whatever. And one of the things like the, the dungeon master does is they have to kind of play as the system. And so, you know, that idea of turning like the game mechanics themselves into the system that is being resisted, I think is really interesting. Whereas here, it seems like the goal is to encourage the player to cooperate with the system, the game system, but also like Queen Wendy and, and her system. And then also Wendy's as the place that sells you the hamburgers you should eat while you play. And like, you know, it's like kind of all about um, kind of working inside of the, the constraints that have you've been set up on you. So yeah, that, no, that's really interesting. Thank you so much. Uh, no, not Shadowrun. That's not what I was thinking of. Um, no, I, I'll, it was a Kickstarter uh, game that came out a couple of years ago. So I, I will find it um, and I will email it to you guys so you can check it out. Maybe I'll find, if I can get the PDF, I'll email it to you guys. Uh, Benjamin, you have, have a hand raised. Yeah, I mean, Hi. okay, well, I had a few things that I was going to touch on, but kind of as our discussion has evolved, especially with a lot of the topics that Eric brings up or mm. brought up, sorry. Um, I guess what I had kind of changed, like what I had to say kind of changed. So if I kind of stumbled around. No, then, that's great. Yeah. But um, like the bringing up like the kind of almost like marginalization in a way of, of certain groups really makes me wonder, like, and it connects back to what we we're talking about before is kind of like what exactly what audience is the, the companies like trying to appeal to in a way, mm. because I know we had kind of had this debate almost before where it was like, you know, on one hand, we have, you know, seasoned, like, Dungeons and Dragons or role-playing game veterans who kind of see this game as, you know, like, oh, you know, this is lackluster, this is lacking. And then you kind of have this other crowd that is like, you know what, I didn't think it was too bad, um, especially those who are, like, newer. They're like, because I was one of those people who had a tiny bit of d and and role-playing experience, but not a whole lot. And through my playthrough, I honestly felt like, you know, like, this wasn't so bad. Mm. And I, you know, as a more inexperienced individual I really just lacked the more hold on a second. <laughs> sorry that was my uh, roommates are coming in anyway oh, no problem. Uh, as I was saying I kind of just lacked the the almost like comprehension in order to to see past what it was and it kind of just brings me to like some other things like when I saw other when I saw other people's reactions especially like Eric's um, I didn't really think of it that way because uh, I guess my mind just wasn't aligned to those kinds of like ideologies. So when I, when I see certain types of like things that are considered like internet culture, I don't fully like appreciate or understand anything about like what, you know, whether it's its origins or it's uh, proper portrayal or anything like that. So I was kind of thinking just like that as in where, like what audience are they trying to appeal to and what are they kind of trying to to say and show to this particular audience because um you know obviously as a really big corporation as a huge brand they have a lot of power and they have a really big voice that they can direct towards whatever they want and you know like i'm sure you know as we already discussed their ultimate goal was just you know let's sell things mm. um you know sell food increase their numbers but it really makes you wonder like exactly to what kinds of people are they trying to sell it because ultimately like uh, again, you know, uh, as an inexperienced D&D player and someone who didn't really care about Wendy's, I went through the whole thing and sure, it could have been a little fun, but ultimately I kind of knew like I was only playing this game because it was for class and I really didn't care any more about Wendy's any more than I did before. Yeah, um, a lot of good points there. I guess, yeah, that is one thing to think about too. Like 
is it one, it's one thing to have stumbled upon this game. Like, so the way that I discovered it was a friend of mine posted on Twitter, like, can you believe that this game exists? And so it felt like an organic, I didn't see like Wendy's posted about it. I saw a friend of mine posting about it and saying, this thing is so weird. We got to get some people together to play it. And that felt like this organic, like grassroots type of, oh, wow. Like this, this weird thing exists. Um, and then you go do research into it and you see like, oh no, they have like a website and on the website is a button where you can click to order Wendy's. Like it's, it's not grassroots. It's very like top down, but I wonder if that experience of discovering it might predispose people to feel differently about it, as opposed to being assigned this game and having it framed as an example of adver gaming. And like, how does that prime you to kind of engage with it differently? Um, so that was just what popped into my mind. But maybe do other folks want to respond to what, what Benjamin said? Like, who who do you really think is either the intended audience for this or, or who do you think is the, the factual audience that it turned out to be for? It, are these, so I have hands that are already up, but are they different from the hands who want to answer this question? Erin, go ahead. I had like a different thing to speak about, but I also think that it's important to talk about this, if that's okay. Do I don't want to answer this message. and then switch us. How about that? Sounds perfect. Okay. okay. So I think it's kind of interesting because I, now that I've heard like people's responses to it and just like the general discussion, I think maybe my point of view has changed a little bit, bit because I think Joyce was talking in the chat and basically talking about how like as a first time player, it's really nice to have something familiar to kind of ease yourself in. Like a lot of people nowadays are making like Disneyland TTRPGs, like one shots mm -hmm. that are like, I'm gonna go to the mall with my friends, like super, like just like normal, like living life kind of d, &D stuff, mm -hmm. which is really appealing to people who have never role played before. Cause it's honestly terrifying. Like it makes sense. So I think that maybe Wendy's did succeed in a certain regard because like even if seasoned players have their qualms with it if new players can still appreciate it even if it's not to like a huge regard or mm. at least it gets their foot in the door that can't really be a bad thing right like that aspect of it be making any player comfortable not bad mm. which like Exactly. Like Unsleeping City and Fantasy High Super fall into that, which is why like I think Kids on Bikes is again, sorry to bring it up, is a better alternative because you can have that simplicity and that familiarity without being too railroaded. Mm. Um, but I understand kind of more of the appeal of it. And I also apologize if it seemed like I was um kind of ragging on it too much because oh, no. I think that first experiences with any kind of TTRPG can always be fun. So mm. the fact that anyone enjoyed it, that's an important thing. <laughs> just as a, a so, and then I'll let you go to the point that you wanted to make earlier, but just as a general thought, I feel like, I mean, so I, I'm, I'm a critic and it's like the thing I was trained to do and, and it's my job. And I feel like the easiest thing to do is either to say something is crap or to say, I will defend this with my life. This is my son, right? And then like the thing that makes a good critic is sitting with it a little longer, like listening to other perspectives and being willing to work in those nuances. And so like, so don't, don't be like, oh, I'm sorry, I was ragging on it too hard. Cause I feel like everyone's, everyone's first reaction is usually something of like, like some, something strong, right? And be just the willingness to like be in a group to talk through this kind of thing, or, or just even like in your own head to sit, to sit with it and be like, well, but let's maybe pick this apart a little more, I think is like what makes for a good critic. So I just, as a general, maybe like to, when you guys are writing papers for this class or whatever, you might like write your first version of the paper and it's like all one way or all the other way. And then, you know, maybe sit with it for a little while and then go, um, add a little like nuance or add a little like wrinkle here or there. Um, anyway. That was just my like a uh, scholarship tip, I guess. But if you wanted to go ahead then and, and change us into the another direction of what you were thinking about when you originally raised your your hand, your hand um, emoji. 
that's actually a super helpful thing that I will take into <laughs> consideration and I might go back and write more on my journal because oh, oh. I love the perspectives. This is fun. Okay, so um, I also wanted to touch on what Eric kind of discussed and I was talking with like other people in this class about this, how like you touched on in your article how Wendy's as is is kind of like dubious. Like all corporations are yeah. in a one way or another. They're a giant like group of people and everyone has problematic issues, whatever. Yeah. And such because like Wendy's morally and ethically we can say isn't awesome, isn't mm. great. They've done a lot of incorrect things. So for them, in addition to utilize like queer voices or like voices that aren't their own feels even worse because like if we're playing a game where we know that it's attached to a company that already already doesn't have the greatest like ways of supporting these com communities then mm. if they then use that without directly supporting it feels even worse because when we talked about um I, I don't know if we've directly talked about it yet but the uh, old spice D, D thing that our professor wrote a article on which is really mm -hmm. interesting because there's a part where basically they're like there's a it's it's like a character class called the gentleman and it's supposed to be like oh we're super woke because there's also a gentle lady and mm. it's like okay well the fact that you had to directly make this distinction that you can have a female aspect of this character already proves you failed because you have mm. to say that right mm. so for them to like also, Old Spice is really weird. In general, like their ads, kind of gross in my opinion. Okay. So for them to like not really support specific communities and then come around and be like, I'm going to use you as a community to make us seem cooler, even though we haven't directly supported you, makes it feel worse. So mm -hmm. by playing something like the Wendy's system, it's like, I can just play something without feeling gross about who made this. Like mm -hmm. Wizards of the Coast is honestly much better and it feels better in well general. I don't know I don't know what you guys are reading this semester it'll be interesting to see if you feel that way about Wizards of the Coast because <laughs> yeah the, the, I mean they are also maybe coming under fire for certain things of late and so it'll, I don't know I don't want to like oh no, <laughs> oh, no. Well, just you know things like uh I don't want to say this um any any cor every, every corporation are you a corporation that exists under capitalism like you are also guilty of this so it's it's almost in a way it's maybe a little unfair to wendy's because it's like the reason they're getting yelled at is because they made a game because like mcdonald's does bad shit all the time right <laughs> but also but I, I don't think that like makes your critique wrong it's just it's just interesting like um we expect better of you perhaps because you're engaging in this thing that we like hold up as like this imaginative escape and it has these like liberatory possibilities and it's you know it's creative co-authorship and and so it's like we, we are we almost want to say we want that to be associated with entities of virtue and maybe there just aren't any under capitalism but Wow. Anyway, uh, let's not talk about that anymore because it's a bummer. Um, are we still good on time, Aaron? We can keep going past the hour. Awesome. Um, Jeanette had her hand raised for a very long time, or is it her? Sorry. Yeah. I was like, you're like a little capybara, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there you are. Sorry. Yeah. Hello. Um, I also like that previous conversation was kind of a good segue into what I wanted to comment on. Um, we planned that ahead of time. <laughs> so um this was the first game that I've ever dm'd for and so I was the person in charge of like reading ahead of time and like seeing what we're going to be doing and all that stuff mm. and um it was just such an odd experience <laughs> mm. to see um and like just seeing all of these four for four jokes ahead of time it's just like you used it one too many times really mm. but um something that I really wanted to comment on was uh Wendy's lack of self-awareness in creating this game, uh, just because of the farmer situation specifically. I know we commented about this like earlier in the previous class um, and all that stuff, but that whole situation felt so odd to me just because their only purpose in the story was to give the players 
you know, food if they asked for it. And they're supposed mm -hmm. to do it happily without like being like weird about it. It's just like, oh, you want these tomatoes? Yeah, for sure. Let me give them to you. And it's just like, that is kind of weird, especially since you're not like, you know, supporting your farmers in real life. Mm -hmm. And one of my players actually <laughs> asked the farmers, oh, how are your working conditions? You know, <laughs> and then I was trying to figure out like what to do in that situation because, you know, and I was just like, um, you know, we actually signed a contract saying that we aren't allowed to talk about our working conditions, but yes. <laughs> and like that's what this I did. First just... DMing, that's brilliant. You're <laughs> yes. a genius. <laughs> Thank you. But the whole like situation left like a bad taste in my mouth afterwards. Mm. And I was just thinking about it the whole time. And um, just like all these like jokes about four for fours and like their French fries and their Frosties and things like that. Like, yeah, it was fun when you don't take it seriously, but when you try reading it like between the lines, it just mm. feels so wrong. Um, so I just wanted to comment on that. Like just Wendy's lack of self-awareness in creating this game and in their like voices in mm. like presenting their like NPCs and their world and all that stuff it just felt really weird <laughs> so mm. yeah that's all I wanted to talk about well okay I'm just at awe at your ability to think on your feet as a DM and come up with it that's so good but let me <laughs> ask you this so as the DM you're asked that question did you feel pressure to like give a response that would, would at the very least not reflect negatively on Wendy's like because I feel like if you're the DM and you're reading ahead and you know like what the narrative arc is and that yeah. Wendy's is the best or whatever like did you feel pressure to like I got I can't just say shit because then it's gonna like derail the whole story and the story's on rails so I have to keep them on it like did, so there was definitely a lot of panic on my part because it was my first time DMing mm. and like I wanted to give my players that freedom to like go I was like I was like okay if they want to fight against Queen Wendy you know all for that but I definitely mm. want to steer them towards the actual story just because it was my first time DMing and yeah. that's what I prepared for um but there were so many moments where my players were just like no we want to stick it to Wendy we don't want to do this we don't want to help them and all that stuff and and I was just like the whole entire time I tried to make it seem like oh if they try to oppose Queen Wendy the entire city will oppose you so yeah. it was just kind of like I was kind of forcing them on that idealism of Wendy but um I definitely wish I could have uh, handled that better in creating a place where they can you know actually do whatever they want but um oh but no that makes just, total sense yeah. though because it's like well I don't want to have to stop the game to quick, like write a character sheet up for Wendy. Cause like, I don't have one. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, this is what's prepared. So I do have to kind of nudge you back on track. If you want to go, it's not like, you know, Oh, I've already pre-prepared, you know, all these NPCs and I, I know what they're like. Charisma is, and I know what they're, this is like, I don't think Wendy has stats because you're not supposed to like touch her. She's, you're supposed to love her from afar yeah. and say she's so wonderful. Yeah. Awesome. But yeah, so that's just what I wanted to comment on. But yeah, no, thank yeah. you so much. Um, Adriana. Hi, Megan. It's so Did nice I pronounce that you. correctly? Yeah, you've got it. Awesome. Um, I'm one of Aaron's grad students and I had a thought somewhere in there about capitalism and then everyone said so many wonderful things that I don't really have the thought anymore. I'm, some of you guys have had your hands up for so long and I'm so sorry, but I get distracted very easily and, and love just following the rabbit holes. So yeah, that's wonderful. Um, I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit to like what you're working on now, if like doing this piece on Wendy's has like influenced where you want to go with your work or I don't know. Yeah. I mean, so like I said, my PhD is in English literature. And yeah, so I, I started that. off, <laughs> represent, uh, I started <laughs> off, uh, my early career was really about like what are the, the sort of narratives and ideologies that that games can promote? And I don't know if you guys are reading like any Ian Bogost, like any um, like how to play video games or uh, but just, you know, sort of like your standard. Uh, we're doing rhetoric, but instead of looking at the rhetoric of a speech or of a novel, we're looking at games. 
And I never really got into the marketing side of things. Um, just because I think I was so excited that someone was giving me a degree to play video games. I was like, I want to play all the games. I don't want to look at these like paratexts, like these peripheral things. But then um, after this project was done, I really have started getting more and more interested in, if not just like advertising in general, like the ways in which games, like digital games especially, are trying to create these like, kind of Marvel universes around themselves. Like it can't just be a game. It has to also have this like external lore and a comic book and a discord where the community has these certain like behaviors and just like how all these things are working together. And, the, you know, there are people who can cross like many media platforms and still stay within the same like realm, the same community. And so I'm working on a piece right now um, about The Sims and like the creator community around The Sims. So like there's The Sims, the game that you can play. And then there's like people who stream The Sims. And then there's people who create mods and uh, clothes and furniture for The Sims and like an out and out and out, right? And so I'm working on a piece right now about uh, people who were trying to create like a hashtag campaign to influence EA to diversify the skin tones within the sims a lot mm. more so if you're like an old school sims fan you know that like some of the especially like black and brown skin tones didn't look like skin they just looked like kind of flat matte coloring whereas like the white skin would have like blush and would light correctly and and like looked like human skin and then this other would just look like weird paint or whatever and so it was uh, kind of started off uh, in the creator community, the people who were, you know, streaming and, and kind of making a living off of The Sims. And then they kind of brought the rest of the fandom in underneath of them. And so kind of like looking at that and looking at how, you know, in this case, it's the opposite direction. Like, so with Wendy's, it's like the company trying to be like, hey, gamers, let us kind of try to re recruit you under our banner. In this case, it was kind of fans trying to corral the company and saying, you know, hey, this is what we want. These are like the values that we have. And so we would, we want you to like come to us and, and demonstrate that you are aligning with us in terms of what we think is important. And, you know, a lot of the campaign revolved around, you know, the reason I got into the Sims was I could create a person who looked like me, but as the game series goes on, it seems like I am less capable of making a person who looked like me. And that seems wrong. Like, it seems like as the technology gets better, I should be more capable of making someone who looks like me. I don't know if that answered your question, but like, I guess this, what this project did for me or, or what it kind of opened up in my mind was like this idea that you can, you can talk about games without necessarily only talking about like, interactions inside like the ludus of the game like without necessarily just talking about algorithms or talking about uh like you know mechanical rule books but you can talk about these sort of like wider communities and i've really been enjoying following that rabbit hole did yeah. that answer your question i'm so sorry no that was really wonderful i'm a big okay. sims fan so that was really cool uh do you mind if i run just like a little experiment out for my own curiosity yeah um for people who can do this, can you leave a reaction if you like really like Critical Role or like do a thumbs up or whatever? I just I want to take a quick poll on it. And then do me a favor <laughs> and keep your oh keep your hands up keep your hands up. Um, oops, I'm gonna forget what that number was at. Um, keep your hands up if you liked the Wendy's game. Did you guys watch it? Um, no, oh, they right. haven't done. Okay. I'm just, I'm curious because um, something I get asked a lot because I, I study Dungeons and Dragons is mm -hmm. why, why are you talking about Critical Role? Um, <laughs> because they, uh, a lot of critique in the area is that Critical Role now is becoming such a big corporation. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm trying to like draw the parallels for myself between them and Wendy and a lot of their marketing practices. Okay. Um, they did take down the Critical Role campaign. 
campaign of Feast of Legends. Um, and I they donated have the a money. Pirate and copy if thing. anyone wants to see it. Oh, they found it on YouTube. Oh, okay. <laughs> they Good. put it on their Discord. Um, but even just like the way that Critical Role markets now, um, mm. like they'll, they'll use the same ad um, copy and like voiceover for different merchandise. Um, and so it's getting increasingly more late stage capitalism. And I'm, I'm just interesting like where that line seems to be for people of too much. Yeah. Um, thank you for awesome. bearing with me. Oh, no, no worries. Um, Tim also had a hand. Yeah, so I, I was thinking about like, was this successful for Wendy's? And like, I, <clears throat> I tried to look up like whether it actually like there was anything for a profit and I couldn't find anything. But I, I did see like there were a lot of articles written about this game when it came out. Mm -hmm. And I think this is, I, I don't want to say that they intentionally tried to make it a bad game. I don't think that was their intention. But I also think that their number one priority was because it's free. Like their number one priority is not to make the game good. Their number one priority is to make be an advertisement. Mm -hmm. And they're essentially like getting all this free marketing from a bunch of like articles, you know, writing about it. But at the same time, their actual, like, I don't know, it feels like it's not enough. Like, just because the game, a lot of people don't like the game, doesn't necessarily mean they're not going to stop. They're, they're going to stop going to Wendy's or go to Wendy's any less because it's not mm -hmm. correlated. But it's still this, like, way of getting it, like, in the public. So I, I don't think they tried to make the game intentionally bad. But I think that, like, as long as it was you know, people talked about it, people posted stuff on it, even if it was negative, I think that they would probably consider that um, a success. And obviously I don't know, you know, how their profits did afterwards, but mm. um, I think it, that's, it, it's sort of like a strange thing. It's like they, it's like, it, it's not really, they didn't really focus on like they're making the game good was not, was not the focus. Right. Well, like, so just, just the same as, so it's not that the food is, it's not trying to convince you that the food is special. It's just trying to convince you that Wendy's is like made a game. <laughs> and so therefore we should like it if we like games in the same way. It's like, it's not trying to convince you that they're good at making games. It's just trying to be a game period. Right. Like if we succeeded at making game, then we have accomplished everything we need in order for a bunch of websites to write an article going, Wendy's made a game crazy. And then there, that, we did it. That's what we wanted. Uh, Aaron has his hand up too. Awesome. Yeah, I just wanted to piggyback on that point, right? That the, the goal I think is just to get people talking about Wendy's mm -hmm. and, you know, in the, the sort of Alice Cooper, any publicity is good publicity. Doesn't mm -hmm. matter if the game is good or bad. It matters that the game exists and people are creating buzz, posting mm -hmm. about it, tweeting about it, and that way they're exploiting the social media ecosystem. Yeah, and in the chat, so in the chat, people are talking about the repeated four for four joke, and that actually reminds me of something else. So, in the text of the book, they are constantly lampshading the advertising by being super obvious about it. And sometimes even like in parentheses saying like, we're saying that because it's advertising, right? And like, does that make it better or worse? <laughs> Cause on the one hand it's like, okay so they, they are at least acknowledge not insulting my intelligence and pretending, pretending like I don't see what's happening. They're at least like knowing like you're smart enough to know what we're doing. And so we're just gonna like tell you that we're doing it. But on the other hand, then it also makes it seem like well, couldn't you have done it in a cleverer way then instead of just like lampshading it and telling me that I'm doing it? Um, is it Gabriel or Gabrielle? Uh, Gabriel. Gabriel, um, what do you think? So the lampshading that you're talking about, um, maybe there was more in the beginning that I didn't notice, but I really only remember seeing lampshading. Like I remember specifically they made a bad pun like a snack of all trades and said sorry in parentheses. I only noticed that showing up in the after part one and more and more as it progressed. 
And I don't know if that's because, like you said, or they just have feel like they need to do what you said and engage with the player more to keep them playing, or if it's just because whoever was writing it was like, okay, my boss isn't going to read as detailed now. <laughs> I can, I understand that what I'm doing is horrible. Let's see if I can somewhat atone for my sins. I don't know which one it is, whether yeah. it's that or what you said. Or is it someone who's very intentionally crafting a persona of a writer who's kind of bored or rolling their eyes at what they're doing because that is the persona of someone who's cool and aloof. And that's a really that. good question. <laughs> right. Like, and I mean, maybe that like, that seems both too conspiratorial to me, but also feels very true in my heart that like, this would be someone who's like in their mind, they're like, what would like a cool internet savvy, like memester, how would, what would their attitude be in writing? And like that, so I'm going to write the the goofy thing, but then I'm going to be like, in parentheses afterwards, I'm going to write like nailed it. I, that's the one that I always remember. It's like in the, it, you're rolling the stats and you got four stats and you roll four dice. Oh, it's like four for four. And then in parentheses, it's like nailed it. <laughs> that, that, I mean, and actually it makes me laugh. So I guess they got me on that one. I'll, I'll give them credit because that one makes me chuckle. <laughs> Uh, Brandon said, nailed it, felt like a line from an early 2000s Disney channel. Yeah, again, like we're maybe a decade behind. Like this is maybe what like a like a Gen X writer thinks a Gen Z reader likes. <laughs> or again, you know, someone trying to like give that, give that impression. Uh, Matthew, you had a response to this. So the topic of self-awareness actually reminded me of a few things because it really depends. Sometimes people really love self-awareness and other times they absolutely hate it. Mm -hmm. In this case, it seems like everyone's kind of in agreement that, or agreement, that um, we didn't like the self-awareness for advertisements that Wendy's had. But in other mm -hmm. cases, um, I heard about this popular wrestler who his whole stick, like everyone knows how wrestling's fake, but this mm -hmm. guy's whole stick was being calm and collected and just like rolling with it like he, he doesn't care like he knows it's fake and so he's not being over dramatic and pretending that it's real he's mm. acknowledging that it's fake but still is gaining a lot of popularity um <laughs> same for like um sans from undertale he's very self-aware it was a very popular character in the game um and so it really just depends on I don't know. I guess it might just be the um, just the corporation itself. So I think it. I um, I don't think it's the idea of Wendy's being self aware. I think it's more the idea of a corporation trying to be self aware. Because if something's self aware, then you would think that they would actually do something about it. Because self awareness. Uh, in turn means, oh, I'm aware enough, so I will try and change something about this if it's negative. But mm -hmm. showing that Wendy is just self-aware enough that they're advertising, but not self-aware enough for other aspects, such as the, um, the labor issues that they had, um, makes it seem like they're just making fun of everybody. Yeah, it's like the person... And I'm so I'm sorry. I feel like I'm cussing too much in your class, Aaron. I'm so, and we're I just remembered we're recording it too, but it's like I'm from New Jersey. <laughs> so sorry about that. Um, but it's like the person who says like, "Well, I know I'm an asshole, but at least I'll tell you." And it's like that doesn't make it better. That makes it worse actually, because it exactly. means you could just stop, <laughs> but you didn't. Yeah, for sure. Um, so the chat said I think we we're on the three minute warning. So Andrew, uh, did you want to take us home with a final comment? Oh, I didn't know I was going to be the final comment. Um, I just wanted to add on to that, uh, like, the whole self-aware thing. I feel like Feast of Legends, like, relied on it because mm -hmm. it had no other substance for comedic timing or anything. Mm -hmm. Where other mediums where they use self-awareness, they might have it as a aspect, but it's not the only thing you're enjoying about it. So when you get to that point, you're like, ha, that's funny. But then Feast of Legends is just like, hey, the 4 for 4, you remember that? Mm -hmm. Let's do it again. 
Yeah. And again, and it's like, it's okay, we get it. We get, you know, that can you move on? We heard it enough. Hmm. Yeah. And so in the chat, so Daniel said something that I think kind of syncs up with what you're saying. He said, there's a difference between lampshading for the sake of appearing self-aware and actually subverting the tropes it's making fun of. Yeah. So it's like making the joke about how like we're winking at you, but then that's as far as it goes. It, it, it isn't actually depth, right? It's just the surface appearance of depth. Yeah, it, it, it just is there because they're like, huh, people like this, but they don't understand why people like it. And they just kind of rely on it mm. only to relate to people when it's, that's not the reason why people relate to it. Right. Yeah. It's like someone who understands the format of a meme, but doesn't understand like the full kind of depth of meaning that you can get out of it. And mm -hmm. so it's like, you know, they post and it's like the right image and the right font, but the caption doesn't make sense. Or it's like, I don't know. I, my brain failed me, I guess, at the very end. I, that wasn't a complete thought, but it made, it made me think a lot about when people will like take, you know, like an internet joke and then they'll just like quote it and it's, but it's the wrong time to quote it. And it's like, well, okay, you thought you just demonstrated a connection, but actually you just demonstrated that mm -hmm. you don't understand what is funny about it or what's relatable about it. Yeah, no, exactly. Mm. Well, is, did we hit the time? Are we out we, of time? We did, but this, I, uh, Megan, uh, or should I say Dr. Condes, thank you so much. Okay, Megan, <laughs> thank you so much for this amazing talk. I am so inspired by it, and I'm so excited to have seen the class participating in such, I think, a thorough way, almost on a graduate level uh, of this. This isn't a graduate class? No, this is an undergraduate. What? I'm shocked. You guys yeah. are awesome. Um, so I, I was really impressed by the conversation here today. So let's all give Megan a huge round of applause. Thank oh, no. you so much. To you.